And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of Array of Champions. And a, and a man who has been more than patient with my technical difficulties today. The one and only Constantine Rice. How you doing today, man? Or tonight, I should say. I'm doing well. Thank you for asking. Uh, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you on. So, I will start with the... I will start with what is tradition for me. The, hum, the humble beginnings, in a sense. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Sure. So um, when I was in high school, um, I was introduced to role-playing games through 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Um, and I really liked the idea of it, of, of role-play games in general, because... Um, it was basically a more imaginative version of video games to me. And uh, then, you know, from fourth edition, I ended up branching out into Call of Cthulhu, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, um, and, and seeing, you know, what else there was beyond D&D. &D. And just, I really, really enjoy um, the combination of role play and a defined... Uh, set of mechanics for gaming, um, I, I, the freeform nature of it. And I think as, as I grew older, I, I, I actually really appreciate 4th edition specifically of um, how it codified mechanics, and I think it was a large source of inspiration for myself. It's always, it's always funny whenever I, meet, whenever I meet someone who has that, has that approach with 4th edition, because... The nickname I've give I've given fourth edition for the longest time on this channel is the edition I'm told I'm supposed to hate but don't because the check didn't clear. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I I can like I, I I've, I've ended up playing Pathfinder first edition three point five stuff so like and and I and I haven't personally played but I understand the appeal of um, second edition AD and D, um, and so I I can totally get the different mindsets clashing with 4th edition's design philosophy and, and a complete rejection of it. Um, uh, I, I fully get that. I, I pick, when it comes to the whole clashing mindset, I will admit I pick on it, but the main reason that I pick on it is um, I've been here before. <laughs> because because a, lot of, a lot of the complaints that you see about 4th edition, I saw those back in 2000 with 3rd. Oh, yeah. Some some of them some of them almost, I'd say about ninety percent word for word ma matching up, to the point where I could do a I could do a swap and change absolutely nothing else, <laughs> and then th then those same people will do will do a one will do a one eighty on the exact same game that they lambasted, and I will be there to give them hell for it because somebody has to. Fair enough. But yeah, so so um, overall, it's it's really just I fell in love with the idea of um, you know role play married with a, a defined mechanical combat in a real setting, and you know this the social aspect. I like playing with my friends next to each other, especially um, nowadays. Uh, video games seem to increasingly have rejected split screen and um, be online only. It's very impersonal, and so I really enjoy just playing with my friends in person. If it's going to be a role-playing game, then great. And and that's kind of been the way it is for like the past like eight years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, as I understand it, with the with um array of champions, when you start when you started hammering this out, you jumped between a bunch of different uh, mechanics before settling on D one hundred. So. I guess yes. where I'd like to I guess where I'd like to start with that with this question is, um, what was the impetus to actually start making Array of Champions, and what were you what were you hoping to get out of it? 
So the creation was actually fun, was the first, first thing that came to mind, was that wouldn't it be fun to try and design your own game and just like commit to it, see what you can make? And that, that, that ended up turning into a much deeper hole than I could have ever imagined it becoming. Um, and essentially what I was looking for, though, from the system was something that had a defined and fun combat system. Because I find very often with role-playing games, um, the combat can typically be lacking, very uninteresting or lacking flair. Um, there's exceptions, and, 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 and I think any game that I say I'm generally dissatisfied with the combat, I've had a satisfying experience in combat from because of the GM that I've been with, not be necessarily because of the system, though. And so I, I, I wanted to make something where, to me at least, the combat, uh, the, the, the mechanics behind it would facilitate interesting combat. Um, and then role play wise, I've, I've always liked free form role play. Um, I, I very much did not want to codify uh, like a charisma stat or something like that. You know, I, I don't like rolling for diplomacy. I want to convince the other person. And so things that um, people might enjoy, like social combat mechanics, you're not going to really see that in my game because to me, it's always just been the fun of role play is the freeform nature of it. Mm -hmm. Which I can... I can see I can see that, um, especially since social mechanics is one of those things that so many games have struggled with. Yeah. That now, being said, I, oh sorry, didn't mean to talk over you. But what but um, would it be fair of me to say that that this is a game that you ended that that you ended up rewriting rewriting in in some cases because you felt you wrote yourself into a corner in some of the early drafts yes uh, I, I essentially finding an interesting combat system that would be fun um was it was basically a, a trial and error lesson uh where you're I'm, I'm trying to take from a bunch of different games trying to figure out what is fun like what do i like about combat what do I want combat to actually be? And as a result, uh, that just kept me scrapping the first 30,000 words for, clap, uh, for classes, uh, which now I guess I refer to as paths, and just rewriting it over and over and being like, no, this, this still isn't what I want. These paths aren't interesting enough. They don't do enough in combat. Um, I, they, they, I, I, I don't like this. Let, let's try again. And, and it, it, it took quite a bit to just be like, all right, all that work you did, just delete, go again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, the result is something that I am rather satisfied with. I think it, it ha has room for depth without um, being tedious. And I do like putting the impetuous on the player. Uh, the GM doesn't roll dice. Um, Except for perhaps damage dice, so um, yeah. And since it's since it's D one hundred, here's the here's the um, obvious question I ha I have to ask: mm -hmm. Are we are we doing are we are we on the role master kind of D one hundred, or are we on the call of Cth are we on the basic role playing D one hundred, i.e. roll high or roll low? Yeah, we're we're on uh, roll low. So so. Um, the way it works, let's take an, a, a basic example. Um, we're going to do a, a basic strike action against a goblin. Uh, you're going to take your weapon attack, you're going to subtract the other individual's physical defense, and you're going to roll under the number. If uh, after the subtraction, the result is 100 or greater, don't roll. You're going to hit because you can't roll, you know. You know, uh, higher than a one hundred on a D one hundred. So, yeah. mm -hmm. and I'm guessing um, there's been there's plenty of roll under D one hundreds that have different thresholds for criticals and the like. Um, 
Some put it at five. Some put it as low as one. Um, what's the de what would be the default critical threshold or its or its equivalent in your system? Default is one, and it's maximum damage. Um, it can be expanded. There's abilities that'll increase your crit range. Um, when the GM book and uh, magic item vault comes out, uh, that will have items that will allow or enchantments that will allow crit range to be expanded. But by default, it's one. Yeah. Something I do find I do find kind of interesting is the class and path setup, especially with the naming convention you have with the class. Um, was D twenty Modern one of the games you took a little bit of inspiration from? I, I think subconsciously that there is inspiration from there. It's not something I directly thought about, but yeah, it, it, it is something easy to uh, attribute it to. Yeah, I, I mainly say that because of the naming con the naming convention. You know, inspirational hero, cunning hero, valorous hero, inexplicable yeah. hero. Um, granted, I, 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 go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. Did I, I was going to say that um, I, I guess it really came down to what do all the different you know fighter type things like what, what's a fighter, a barbarian, a paladin, all have in common? They're valorous. You know, you threw that in there. What is what's a bard and a priest have in common? Well, they're very inspirational. Um, the, the the wizard one, I I, I think it, you know all the different magic casters out there. Inexplicable is a bit of a stretch, but I think it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind, of course the 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 other aspect is the path is the path system, which I get the feeling the path that the path system is is your is your means of ref of refining each of the classes. The classes are kind of a chassis that is filled up with the path. Yes, so um, the game is 20 levels, uh, much like D&D. Um, odd levels, you will get one ability from your basic class and three from your path. Um, even levels, you get two abilities from your race. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's, it's very much the path is forming much of the identity since three quarters of your abilities uh, from your odd levels are going to be coming from your path. Which is which is why um which is why paths have ten levels worth of abilities. Yes, so so paths have thirty abilities each. Um, the basic class is ten. So you, if you have ten levels in your path, then you have forty abilities plus the signature ability of your path. Mm -hmm. So forty one. It, it it may seem intimidating, but by breaking the abilities into different phases in a combat round, it allows um, significantly less mental burden, especially if you take advantage of page three of the character sheet, print multiple copies of it to be your reference sheets. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, I'd let, I, obviously going through all of the paths would be ridiculous would be ridiculous in and of itself. Yes. So I'd like I'd like to just go through the basic classes and what sort of what sort of archetype, what sort of niche each one is supposed to be fulfilling, and some and some of the more familiar classes that would fit right in with th with those particular um, those particular hero types in array of champions. Certainly. So I'll start with the inspirational hero. Okay. So the inspirational hero is your typical support. Um, it's dishing out buffs. It can heal. Um, it could be actually support in a variety of ways, and that is kind of how the paths will come in as to how it supports. So you, we'll start with something traditional. A bard, um, they're going to be supporting the team by um, taking the basic ability of the inspirational hero um, which is, um, I'm sorry, I, I, I just need one moment. I want to make sure I have my thoughts gathered before I say this. <sighs> okay, so yes, the inspirational hero, inspiration is their basic ability. So the bard takes it, 
and is going to modify it to start affecting more allies to have a larger range. Um, it's basically an all-arounder support. It's going to do some interesting things. It has flavor. Uh, one of my favorite things about the Bard is uh, actually a reaction called failing upwards, where uh, if you missed in the, in the conflict phase, you can turn that miss into such an embarrassing blunder that it provokes threat attacks, which are basically opportunity attacks. So it provokes a threat attack from, enemy, from enemies. And then those enemies, if they fail to hit you, they're magically compelled to perform their own embarrassing blunder that provokes threat attacks from your allies. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's very fun. But then you've got um, some really weird supports, like uh, the Architect, where you're literally placing walls around the battlefield and like your support abilities start from the walls. You can create spiked ones. Your allies can shove them uh, into, your, into the walls and do extra damage. You've got... Um, Let's see, what's another little fun thing? Oh, uh, Heralds, uh, buffing uh, everyone's speed and trying to build momentum and like turn everyone into the Flash. <laughs> it, it, it goes all over the place. So, you know, maids slash butlers have uh, threads that they're using to manipulate their allies and make them do weird actions. Um, it's, it's, oh, you've got the Pain Cultist trying to redistribute damage from others uh, to itself and then also redistributing damage it takes to others and, the, and damaging allies to buff them. It's, it's basically, it's a support path that the flavor comes from the paths. Mm -hmm. I, I think I got a little too passionate there. <laughs> yep. Sorry about that. No, no worries. I will, ne I will never get on anybody for, for being passionate. Um, cunning hero. Right. So um, those are your rogue types. Um, something I neglected to mention with the inspirational. Um, so in general, the combat round, it's six phases. The first phase is pre-movement. It's characterized by buffing actions. And the inspirational hero dominates the pre-movement phase because they get an action in the pre-movement phase for every inspirational hero level. So by 10th level, they have 10 pre-movement actions. And um, pre-movement actions are buffs. So the cunning hero, on the other hand, uh, you get gambit actions for every level. And gambit actions are typically debuffs. So they're looking to cripple and weaken the enemy. They're looking to attack the back lines. They are a form of support, but they're doing it by hindering instead of helping. Mm-hmm. So, next up would be the Valorous Hero, which we kind of dip, <coughs> dipped into already. Yeah, so, so the Valorous Hero is um, your frontline damage dealers. They are both um, going to be taking damage, um, or, or at least doing the, or trying their best to tank it anyway, and deal it. They're, they have interesting ways of going about it. Um, some Valorous heroes could be more of a backliner, and some inspirational heroes more of a frontliner. Um, it depends. I, I, something that's rather fun, in my opinion, for the Valorous hero is the Void Knight, mm -hmm. where so Valorous heroes, their phase that they dominate is maneuver. And the idea of the maneuver phase is you are preparing a bunch of actions that then, when the conflict phase comes, and conflict actions are those that deal damage you are manipulating the conflict actions with your expended maneuvers to do interesting things with them, or even or basic things like extra damage. Mm -hmm. The Void Knight I enjoy where it's signature ability. Uh, every single maneuver you modify a basic strike with enables the basic strike to have additional range, and so eventually it reaches the point where like you're slashing your sword at 200 feet away. Like, <laughs> so... Yeah, that, that kind of summarizes the Valorous hero. Mm -hmm. And Inexplicable Hero. So the Inexplicable Hero is a, a combination of all-rounder. It is going, depending on what path you have, you could be bringing some buffs to the field, you could be doing some debuffs. Um, the main thing it brings is, compared to the other ones, though, that would be different is 
a variety of conflict actions and reactions. Mm -hmm. um, so typically speaking, the other paths, in addition to their basic strike conflict action, you might have one or two other interesting conflict actions to deal direct damage with. Whereas the inexplicable hero, you know, your typical wizard is gonna have a fireball, they're gonna have a hail of ice, they're gonna all have um, basically this, this large variety of conflict actions that they then modify with their reactions to do interesting things with. Yeah. Now, when it comes to races, one thing I notice is that they have they have some of the for, they have some of the formatting that you'd see for the paths. So, are races treated as an, as another type of path that you have access to? Yes. So, your character is a combination of their basic class, their path, and their race. Even level ups, uh, so two, four, six, eight, etc. Uh, you are gaining a level in your race. And um, the races in, are basically like a lesser version of your class and path combination. Um, they're not going to be as in-depth or as interesting, um, but they do have their own form of creativity and they could allow you to branch out from your basic role or to go even more into it. Mm -hmm. Now, with that... With that in mind, it does the way that the way that this is set up. It does sound like th that um the idea of do that there isn't really a wit a wizard path in the traditional sense. A lot of the wi a lot of the wizards or the casters that I'm seeing are somewhat specialized in a particular type of casting. Yes, there there is a generic wizard. He does exist, but for the most, but that's one of thirty paths. Mm -hmm. uh, now, with that in mind, has has multi has multi path or or I guess multi classing, um, in the form of taking multiple paths, been been something that's been brought up. It has been brought up. It was considered and ultimately rejected because I wanted to have a balanced experience um, where. I wanted the room for crazy shenanigans, crazy combo, cr crazy things for your character to be able to do. Like a you know a tenth level necromancer, I believe, can have a million skeleton followers. Um, that being said, I don't want um, that 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 those big epic abilities um, that build on themselves on each level. For, for a character to fall behind because you did multipathing um, by mistake. I, essentially, I want it to be fun, but I don't want any character to fall behind, and so the sacrifice was no multipathing. Mm -hmm. Which cer certainly makes certainly makes sense, and somebody and somebody multipathing a certain way could result in things getting a little bit ridiculous. Yeah, you could either end up above or below the expected trajectory, and I just don't think that's fun. Mm -hmm. Now, given the, given how front loaded um, character creation is, um, <coughs> was this a, was this a game that you had that you had built with a specific setting in mind, or did you, or was it a case where you wanted to go um, set somewhat setting agnostic? So I do have a setting in mind. I will admit it's not fully fleshed out yet. That's going to be for the setting book. Mm -hmm. um, but I did have a setting in mind where I wanted high fantasy, over the top adventures. You know, I I I, I, I appreciate low fantasy. I appreciate that starter band, kill a bandit. You know, stop stop the bandit quest. But I really, really loved, I think my favorite campaigns were ones where things got over the top and ridiculous and uh, were trying to negotiate with NPCs to basically build armies and stop go literal gods and, you know, oh, the trials of Hercules. Th those sort of over the top things are the source of adventure that I wanted. At the same time, though, I wanted to have a little bit of a unique twist in there, too. You'll notice that the races, they include things that are 
typically considered enemies. You know, you've got giants, you've got minotaurs, you've got naga, orcs, vampires. These are default races in the game because in the official setting, all races have morality. They have sentience. They are not mindless monsters that are here to prey on you for existing and being a lesser being or something, or, be or they're not primal beasts of nature. They are living, breathing creatures. They have thoughts, feelings. Um, you, you, your neighbor could be a vampire. You could have blood in, in the back for him in, for emergencies. Mm -hmm. It's that type of setting. Now, that being said, I still want for there to be a unifying, um, incomprehensible force. I think I went a little Lovecraftian and... Uh, in, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Unintentionally, be with uh, the Atlasians where it's basically an outsider realm of creatures that are incompatible with the planes of existence of Santara. Uh, all, and that the, the, these are, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, some people are going to want a game where you're just fighting the big bad guys and it's not too complex. And, and that's sort of what the Atlasians are for, but you, they're going to be much more interesting in what they can do and in their abilities and i think my system has facilitated the creation of an interesting bestiary which i'm very happy with yeah now something else i did find interesting is the design you have for weapons and armor which is one of the the importance of weapons and armor is one of those things that's can, that's kind of gone by the wayside with a lot of games whereas mm -hmm. here it's another thing that's going to play a big factor in your particular playstyle when it comes to the maneuvers and passives that wep that weapons have. It's not just damage die and um, damage type. Yes, in in indeed. I, I I I think you can kind of look at the root philosophy of my design as what could be fun. Is it really fun? In, in, in combat for your weapon to just be a vehicle of damage. Wouldn't you like it if your weapon was a little a little more complex? It had a little more flavor, not enough to overwhelm you and to have like a whole subsystem just centered around your weapon, but like just something to make it meaningful. And, and, and so that led to uh, the weapon system you see before you. Um, and then likewise for armor, um, so, I, I know that a lot of people dislike um, armor as dodging, which, uh, you know, how D&D handles it, and prefer armor as damage reduction. I, I saw that in a lot of discussions uh, of game design. But in, in this case, I kind of figured I've already kind of layered on the complexity for armor. Let's keep it a little more simple, but give it just a tiny bit of spice as well, where armor is giving you um, bonus... All the armors in the game are good, and it's and, and in fact they are as equally good as other armors within the same class of light, medium, and heavy. It's just where the defensive statistics are distributed. You know, you're going to be more light, more agile. You have more AOE defense. Mm -hmm. You're more tanky with this armor. You have more physical defense, and so you're you know and and if you know what kind of foes are coming up. You might want to swap what sort of armors you have or seek a different gear to you know deal with an enemy more easily um I, I figured it brought just enough spice and complexity without overdoing it and um, since you know you're already managing your path abilities your race abilities there's now your weapon to consider i, I figured just as this one thing let's have it be a little spicy without being over the top like the rest <laughs> yeah and same thing. Same thing applies to to armor because in a lot of now I will admit this is me. This is me. Do, this is me doing my own very biased opinion. But in a lot of fantasy games, the ideal way to equip your character is good old sword. Is good old sword and board. You know, long sword, large shield. Sometimes bastard sword, depending on the game. Yeah. Because good amount of offense, good amount of defense. Not not too much in one end, not too much in the other end. It is, in my opinion, the most basic of basic bitch ways to equip a character. Indeed. Not that, not that there's anything wrong with that. 
Hmm. You know, basic can be fun in its own way. Yeah. And 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 as you know, someone who builds their character like that, they will have a perfectly function functioning character. Yeah. the the point that the point that I'm getting at is through through the through what I'm seeing with weapons and armor, there's the big reason why that's why that kind of why that kind of basic thing happens is there isn't enough of a incentive to equip something else. Oh, it, totally, one hundred percent. D and D and D is just like pierce damage die. <laughs> well, you know, like a, another example of the, of this issue is. And for the longest, one of the big selling points of say, of say the fighter is, you can equ you can equip any weapon. Whoop de do! Most people aren't going to be doing aren't going to be handling multiple weapons. They're going to pick one style to equip their character and stick to it. Yes. So yeah, yeah. you can equip any weapon, no pro no problem. But that ability isn't going to really translate to play when somebody who's picking great sword is. Probably going to be sticking with great swords for most of their adventuring career. Indeed, and 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 when when you mix in the fact that the fantasy is not high enough in the the official settings, there's not enough magic items and gear that um, you, it, to to try and change your weapon will end up you using a much worse one. Uh, there's not there's not enough magic items until until they are because. The most yeah. ubiquitous role playing ga fantasy role playing games have a shit or get off the pot attitude regarding what sort of fantasy they're supposed to be. Yeah. Or in some in some cases, trying to trying to spin one too many plates. Yes. Uh, whereas obvious obviously there is the there is the um there is the damage die and, da and damage type, but also the also a short list of abilities because. Well, even a, I'd say even a, I get the feeling one of your goals was to have, of was to have a decent kit of abilities even for a level one character. Correct. Would it be fair of me to say that one of your other goals was to not have a system mastery archetype? Yes. That's that's kind of what that's kind of what I suspected. And when it comes to armor, what I appreciate is that. Armor is not static. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it changes what statistics can influence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the not the non-static as well as the fact that it's going that it's going to get better as you get better, as opposed to the the issue that a lot of games have, where the armor, where your um, defense bit, where your defenses barely ch barely change with armor, and at higher levels, armor becomes kind of moot. Oh yeah, that, that is something that always confused me. Of um, you know, if we have plus five weapons, where's the plus? You know, and why is plus five armor for Pathfinder as an example? Just uh, here's a little extra AC. It's it's kind of um, boring, I guess. <laughs> so I wanted to have uh, a little variety in uh, how how armor is going to influence statistics, and and I, I and I appreciated Pathfinder at least for. Providing that armor treadmill. <laughs> Appreciate it, but um, I I also I can also uh, I can also appreciate the the um the the first the first time I did the first time I had to deal with the punishment game punishment game at one of my at one of my LGSs, which was one that I would carry over into my games, and that is drink a bottle of bacon soda. Oh. <laughs> Uh, it is as disgusting as you as you think it is. Jeez. Okay. But now I I know that I know that the monster end of things is is one of is still in the works. But yes. I'm curious if you if you intend on doing a full on bestiary or if it's a lighter bestiary with a monster creation system in it um so it's a full-on base bestiary of 400 monsters uh specifically 380 atlasians um and 20 um animals slash monsters beginning with like bears and then ending with a dragon um and then in addition to the 400 monsters, it is going to outline exactly the math behind how to make your own monster um, and, and the types of monsters, how to 
build it in general, there, um, how to scale up monsters for higher levels through mass combat rules. Um, and I think that covers it. I, I feel that there's a part of me that feels like I'm forgetting something, but if it comes up, I'll bring it up. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's going to be um, a very meaty book. I, I, I'm pleasantly surprised with my own progress on the bestiary um because because one of the challenges uh, of it is how the monsters scale they have two abilities per level so you know a level one monster plus their basic strike action so a level one monster you know you've got three abilities to keep track of but then you hit level five and now there's 11 abilities there and Creating 11 abilities um, per monster for the level 5 ones, in of its, or, or I guess 10, since one's just the basic strike, um, mm -hmm. is quite the endeavor. And then you, know, you, then you hit level 20 monsters, and it's like, okay, this thing has 40 abilities on its own. Um, so it, 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 it's, it's a very fun creative exercise to try and figure out how am I going to distinguish these Atlasians from each other through the mechanics I've created. And I, I feel very lucky that I've created that, that my system allows my own creativity to kind of flourish in that way to create little, even little puzzle monsters. I think one of my favorite ones for level one is uh, called Tricky Feet. Uh, the Tricky Feet is basically this little tiny guy who is invisible. He has a Basically, I guess you could even just call it a stand. It's like a giant monster ghost thing. Um, that um, The Tricky Feet is trying to buff its allies while being completely unnoticed. Um, if you attack its little ghost thing, you'll feel that it's wrong. And as a result of that feeling, um, the GM is supposed to discreetly roll um, a perception check for you. One of the rare times the GM actually rolls. Actually, sorry, no. Um, I, I, I forgot, that's an older version. I managed to rewrite that into a way where the GM doesn't even need to roll. The GM takes your hit results as a perception check as well to see if you completely understand that what you're hitting is wrong. And the moment you understand fully that what you're punching isn't real, you can now see the tricky feat. And the reason it's called a tricky feat is because um, it's creating this giant monster um, to, uh, you know, as a distraction while it's buffing its allies, but the footsteps of the monster are all wrong. It's a, tr you know, it's a little thing that, it, and it's trying to make big footsteps. So, yeah, that's just one example of one level one monster. Um, so, yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of went on a tangent there. <laughs> no worries, tangents are part are part of the are part of the game here. Uh oh. But I am, I am. But even even with that, the other thing, the other thing that I find interesting is, in addition to the custom races thing you put in, um, the abilities with sizes. Yes. Was that a case of ma of making an making an element of play that's already present um, interesting? Exactly. Um, yeah. The races are going to be different sizes. You know, a centaur is not the same size as a human. And so a centaur shouldn't operate the same as a human. The human, you know, a medium sized creature should have different advantages to a large sized one. Um, and yeah, that was kind of just inspiration of like, okay, I, I already have races kind of as their own class. And so there's, there's, there's distinguishment through that. But what about races that are the same size as each other? Let's, um, or, or different sizes rather. Let's try and put a little extra spice. All right. So yeah, that's that's the origin of that. And so what size you are grants you three more abilities. And again, that adds to level one. You're going to have three abilities from your size, three abilities from your weapon. Um, you're going to have one ability from your basic class. You're going to have four abilities from your path. It may, and, and I think what's fun is I'm, I'm seeing you have all these abilities and a lot of people are going to go, oh God, how's a player going to keep track of that? Again, it, the combat round, it's seven phases 
and players go simultaneously during these phases. So as long as you have a reference sheet that is organized of, OK, all my pre-movement abilities are on this page, next page, here's my maneuvers, next page, here are my conflict actions, here's my reactions, here's my gambits. Mm -hmm. It's all manageable, and it plays surprisingly quickly, which um, actually, or I guess unsurprisingly quickly in my case, since I designed it. But it's, it's, it's something I'm, I'm very happy about, that I can throw this amount of customization at people and or uh, in terms of their in-game tactics, and they won't get overwhelmed because it's all broken up in digestible chunks. Yeah. Uh, now take now taking that taking that into account, I'm guessing that would it be fair of me to say that this is not a game that is stri that is strictly doing grid-based combat? It's leaning more into theater of the mind. So. It's actually um, designed for either. Everything um, is, is outlined in feet increments for abilities. So you can play on a five-foot grid, a five-foot square grid, um, and it will work just fine. Likewise, as long as your you know, a theater of the mind is very much a GM-oriented skill to make it. Um, that's the word I'm looking for. To make to make theater of the mind feel visceral and real to players, where like to understand their positioning takes a very good GM, in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And so I think honestly, that kind of GM, they're going to pull off theater of the mind in just about any system. Um, I, I I I I wish I could pump up my system and say, oh yeah, it's fantastic for theater of the mind. But really, I, I think I'd be me discrediting all the good GMs who use it. So <laughs> I, I will say that my system works very effectively for grid-based, and any skilled GM is going to be able to apply their skills to this game. Mm -hmm. Now, taking that taking that into account, taking that into account, the. F what would you say, what would you say you'd be shooting for as far as a release window for the be, for the bestiary? End of March. End of end of March, which is which yeah. we're coming which we're going to be coming up on soon. Yes. Um, I can I can certainly see that. Um. Now with that with that in mind. Since the, since there's been a lot of doing and redoing with the game with the game, um, what have what were some of your what were some of the big takeaways you ended up learning? Are, are arguably the hard way during playtesting. Um. So it's that I, I think the the hard way. That um, let's see. I'll, I'll actually, I want to answer this question as cleanly as I can. So I just want a moment to think. Mm -hmm. The distinction between rules as written and rules as intended is uh, something that I'm sure everyone has heard about and has um, debated about even on their preferred internet forum. However, seeing it live in practice from something I wrote <laughs> is very much a, a eye-opening experience of how precise you need to be with your words and the room for error that you are creating every single time you write a sentence. <laughs> and when there's 225,000 words in this book, there's a lot of room for error. <laughs> so I, I think it, it really instilled diligence because what the players read is not necessarily what i meant unless i am very precise with my words mm -hmm. so with and i can i can certainly see that and there's and i've had more than my fair share of experiences of um using and abusing um rules as written both ways not to be not to be a rules lawyer to try and make some OP thing and then claim it isn't that bad, but just to find little ways to mess with people. Yeah. 
but with all, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how th how things develop within Array of Champions. Uh, and, of and with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Well, I'd like to thank you for having me on. Uh, this, it was a pleasure. Um, I, I know that I went on some side tangents, and a couple times I even talked over you, and apologies about that. Um, I, I really appreciate this opportunity. It was, it was very fun. Mm -hmm. And of course, anytime you see fit to, ret to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks to ev to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>